Okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the Hashi Talks today. Uh, my name is John Dahoney. I'm a solution engineer here in Los Angeles. And what I'm going to be talking about today is using dynamic secrets with Cassandra. Um, the motivation for my talk was we have a great learn channel and we talk about Postgres, but we don't really pick on the NoSQL databases that much. And I bumped into a few little uh, hiccups getting this going. So I thought I would share my experience with you as well as uh, some of my experience as, uh, as an information security professional and how to think about um, database secrets in your environment. So I guess we've got to ask the question, why do we even care about database secrets? Well, the big problem are passwords, right? And I think we're all guilty of passwords kind of like this. Um, you know, of course, there's the famous password, password, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. So we all have been guilty of this. And, you know, over the years, people in enterprises have seen this and they create password policies, right? And password policies are supposed to solve a lot of problems. Well, they also create other ones, right? Um, and then pops up this, this issue with post-it notes, because not only do we have password policies, now we have mergers and acquisitions. We have, you know, dozens of computers we need to log into. Um, and then, of course, there's the specialization of databases. You know, I mean, we have different types of distributed databases, relational databases, um, you know, inverted list databases, network databases, NoSQL databases. So data scientists can, can focus their problem on a specific data model, which makes them more efficient, which there's nothing wrong with that but it creates a problem we like to call as information sprawl. And to kind of illustrate this point, you guys remember back in the news about a year ago when people were throwing their kids down the sewer drains, you know, in Hawaii on vacation. And, and lo and behold, after, after that, you know, we saw a picture of the control center there and look, look, at what, look, look at what was going on there. We had passwords written on post-it notes, you know, and this was a control center that was, you know, guarding our country. So everybody is, 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 is guilty of this one. And it's not even just uh, government agencies, but private companies are vulnerable too. Um, you know, illegal criminal access happens all over the place. And, and the target of these, or what they like to call the honeypots, are databases. And the other issue that compounds this problem is, is that, you know, I underline this, is that once these attackers get into the system, a lot of times they're just not there. They, they dump the, the database, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand records. They stay in there for a long time. So there's actually security principles that can be employed and are, 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 are eloquently employed in HashiCorp's vault that um, allow for what we call privilege bracketing. And I'll get into this um, in, in the next couple of minutes here. But once again, you know, the point is to be made is, is that, you know, there's, there's a, you know, there was, there's a, there was a saying among motorcyclists, um, you know, if you haven't fallen, you're going to fall. And it's, it's kind of the same in information security. If you haven't been hacked, you're probably going to be hacked. So the idea is, is to create, go on the offensive and put in place the, the, the uh, systems and controls that will keep people out. Um, so what is the challenge of dynamic secrets, okay? So I, I came up with a couple here. Um, and, and I've seen this in organizations. You know, people don't actually know which access credentials are where. I mean, because of mergers and acquisitions, because of the number of systems going online, this is a problem for management. Um, another issue is, is that a lot of these systems are just old. Um, they weren't designed for this. You know, back, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, people weren't hacking systems like they used to. And people weren't online like they used to. They were client server systems. But now everything's on the internet. So, you know, the whole um, attack surface is a lot larger. Um, and then what happens when we do have a breach? And then the other issue, you know, having been in the operations world, is it practiced? You know, so, you know, having those break glass, you know, capabilities and knowing how to use them are really important. And then finally, this is where I'm getting to is, is that access authorization needs to be refactored to, to meet the 21st century of cyber criminals. Um, and database uh, secrets implemented by Vault is one way to do this. 
So the issue is, as, as we said, is this whole decentralization, multiple databases, mergers and acquisitions, the whole big problem is called identity and secret sprawl. Plain text access um, located in multiple places in the enterprise, okay? That is the issue. So what Vault does is centralize security. And by doing this, probably, you know, of course, you know, we're going to control our costs. We're going to increase productivity with a centralized solution. We're going to know where these passwords are. So a lot of those questions we couldn't answer in the previous slide, we can answer now. But probably most important is the idea of re reducing the, the surface area, uh, the attack surface area, which ultimately reduces the risk. So dynamic secrets have a, an incredible benefit because they're ephemeral, they're bounded. Um, in the information security world, we call this privilege bracketing, which you know pretty much eliminates the time a lease can be done. So if you look at this top uh, portion here, I have a lease ID, which I can use to revoke this. I have a duration, which in this case is five minutes. I only want this lease to last for five minutes. So if somebody got in there, guess what? It, it's only good for five minutes. You know, they're not going to be able to log back in. Um, and then, of course, the username and password aren't exactly the easiest thing for a password cracker to brute force. So you have a lot of great opportunities here. And then, of course, there's idempotence where, you know, are you who you really say you are? And we can audit this. So this is all audited in the log. So you can take a look at the lease ID up here that I flagged with a one and down here in our HashiCorp vault log, which we'll take a look in the demo here in just a few minutes um, and see how that looks inside the, uh, the log. So within Dynamic Secrets, we kind of have two actors here. All right, we have a, an administrative actor that on the one side is going to set up the database backend it's going to do all the configuration and then do what we call create roles. Now, this whole idea of privilege separation is employed in Vault by roles. Now, to take it a step further with Vault, on the enterprise version, we have the ability to create namespaces. So this whole idea of separating different aspects of the company, you know, whether it be business units, regions, departments, this can all be handled with namespaces. And then within namespaces, you can create further roles and, and things of that nature for operations. So things can be locked down to a very, very fine grained uh, capability. And then along comes an, app, uh, an application. Now more than likely what's gonna happen is the application is going to access the vault as a secret, obtain its token, and then use that token to request a set of credentials. And then what is returned is the credentials that would be just like these in the top box up here, where of course the, the, the application isn't gonna to care too much about the lease ID. It probably would be a good thing to know about the duration, but of course it's the authentication with the username and password. So these are the things um, that they would set. And then once again, like, like in this one, you saw that my time to live was five minutes. It's adjustable. It can, it can be whatever makes sense for your company. Uh, the, the best practice here is keep it as, as to the minimum that you have to. Um, a lot of companies will determine a session time, and that's probably a good starting point for the duration of these secrets um, is, is, you know, to make sure that they go along with your web session time. Because a lot of times there, if a session times out, a person will just have to log back in again. Um, and, and there's different types of user experiences that uh, different companies uh, will go after. And of course, you know, you can modify this with the vault. Um, and then finally, um, to, to on top of all this, um, the HashiCorp vault has an engine called Sentinel, and it allows further policies to be applied um, and this is only available in our enterprise uh, edition, but what I've been talking about so far is all available in our open source edition. So um, if you're not using database secrets today, 
um, there's nothing holding you back to going out and downloading a copy and, and start uh, a proof of concept in your environment. So what I'd like to do now is um, show you how I can get to these, and I'm gonna come back to my uh, slides here in a minute. And what I wanna do is um, start up uh, the vault. And I'm gonna start this in developer mode. And what I'm going to do is set up for Uh, my logging and and what I want to do there is just show you the the information that's that's trackable and of course I copied too much in there I copied too much in there and and as you'll see over here on the right side of the window I, I get feedback from the vault that um, auditing has been enabled. Auditing is not enabled by default, and um, it is something that has to be done um, typically when your server started. Most administrators will take care of this, this detail uh, for people. And then um, what we'll do is we'll take a look at um, the audit log before we get out of here. Now, before I go too far, what I wanna do is to make sure that I'm not cheating. Um, Cassandra is, is um, set up with a default user, and I, I just downloaded the Cassandra Community Edition, and um, I left the Cassandra Cassandra user there. In fact, I added myself as a user. But what I wanted to do was just show you before we get started, um, the users that are in there, it's just myself and Cassandra. So what we'll be doing with the Dynamic Secrets Engine is creating these ephemeral logins that will last, you know, in this, in this particular case, um, just a short period of time. And I'll show you how we can adjust this. Um, the, the time to live is something that is, is easy to modify um, with just one command. And um, so what I'm gonna do now, in order to use the Secrets Engine, we have to enable it. And we can enable it to a name that makes a lot of sense in our, in our, in our uh, in our enterprise here. So I'm going to call this my, my mobile development Cassandra database. Okay, so I'm, I'm giving it a name. Um, and I can see that my name here has uh, been used by the Secrets Engine. Now, Vault has many different types of secret engines. And I'm not going to go into all the different ones today because it's, it's going to be enough just to get through these 30 minutes um, with the dynamic secret engine. But once again, this, this, this path could have been called uh, test.mobilecassandra, production.mobilecassandra. It can be set up anyway. And, and also, if you do use the enterprise edition, your namespace can be added to this. So this way, an administrator can very quickly look at this and tell where this particular engine is, is uh, focused and, and where it's applying security in your enterprise. Okay, so once we have enabled the Secrets Engine and we verified that it's working, what we're going to do is enable one of the uh, plugins. And in this particular case, I'm going to enable the plugin for a role that I call my role. Okay, I'm since I am just using my local computer, it's going to use my loopback connector and I'm using protocol version four. There are some of these parameters that are on the database plugin that are specific to the database engine that you're working with. So some of these are, you know, as you can see, the username and password are very specific to Cassandra. Um, now, one of the other things that you can do with some of these engines is rotate this actual user's um, username and password. And in that particular case, we would want to parameterize this uh, to allow for rotation of these credentials. And I'll kind of show you where our plugins are located before I finish today. So I have enabled my Secrets Engine. I have enabled the plugin. Now what I'm going to do is set up for my role. Um, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do most of this. Uh, 
Ah, I don't want to. I got too much. Um, I, I want to. I want to change my time to just a couple of minutes. And uh, hold on here, guys. I just want to go for five minutes. So we can actually watch this timeout. All right. And now what we're going to do is we are going to request access credentials. So this is what your application would do once it fetched its, its um, secret co token from the vault to obtain the, this token that would put in a, in, in a rest header that would make the call to do this. Now I'm doing this on the command line. Now we have three ways of being able to work with the vault. We have a user interface, we have a REST API, and we have our command line that I'm showing you here today. So as you can see here, I now have access credentials that are going to last for two minutes. And what I'm doing is, is I'm creating three of these. And I'm going to use the last one to get at, I'm sorry, uh, to get at uh, the vault. And well, actually, let's do this. I'm going to log in as, as the Cassandra user. And you can see that the three users that I created are here, right? So I could use any of these to log in. They're all different. They're all logged separately. And we'll go take a look at that one in just a second. And um, so everybody is traceable uh, by username, password, and the lease. So if anything bad happened, I could revoke any one of these. Okay, and now let's uh, let's take one of these and plug in the username and password. And and as you'll see here on my login here, you know this one up here was. Cassandra at SQL SH, uh, Cassandra Query Language Shell, okay? And then this one down here is this great big long username that the vault created for us. That in two minutes, a password cracker is not going to perform a, a brute force attack. I feel pretty comfort, comfortable saying that. So what's gonna, what's gonna happen here in, in a few more minutes is, is that these, these privileges are gonna expire. And I'm going to try to log in, and that's just not going to happen. So let's, uh, wh while we're doing this, let's go out here and take a look at the, um, at our log to, and, and as you can see over here in the right window, my secrets just expired, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in just a second and, and try to log in. But let's take a look at this first. And JQ is my friend. It helps me see information very easily. And as you can see here, make this just a little bit bigger. Um, we can see that um, I got, I requested credentials for my role. Um, this was my lease ID. And, and we do encrypt all the information in the vault logs. So there's no concerns about compromise here. Um, so let's go back and try to log in as our user, right? Not going to happen because that user is no longer there. So that lease expired. And once again, that lease could have expired one of two ways. Uh, the first way is via the lease duration um, if that expired or if we decided to revoke um, that particular lease and um, um, not allow them to get in there. Let's just say our, our intrusion detection system uh, detected um, nefarious uh, entry into the system, we could revoke all the leases, break glass, and, and kind of shut down all the databases until we figure out what's going on. 
So um, let's see. So let me get back to my presentation here. I got a few more slides and then I'll have some time for questions. And I went too far. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so, so just to review the three major information security principles that are at play here um, is privilege separation. So what we did was compartmentalize our privileges. Now, very simply here, we just created a role. But within Vault Enterprise, we can create namespaces, we can create roles. So we, we can really employ a lot of privilege separation to lock down access. And then of course, as we saw with privilege bracketing, you know, what we're doing is, is we're providing privileges on an as needed basis. So this particular, in this case, mobile app needed to access this on a, on a read only basis to look up some information. And we, we applied that with a very special user ID and password and the ability with a lease to be revoked with a bracketed time to perform that transaction that would have been determined in advance. And then finally, you know, the idea of are you who you say you really are? Well, this can be audited in our audit log. And then finally, um, you know, as developers, you know, we, we end up having to do a lot of this stuff on our laptops. So um, what I did was um, I created a GitHub. So all this is in the GitHub. I'll, I'll show you guys the link for that in just a second. But I had to make two changes. Uh, Vault does require um, basic auth and, and role-based access to be enabled in Cassandra. So those have to be enabled in the uh, Cassandra.yaml file that's in the conf directory under the Cassandra root. The other thing I found was Java 8 worked flawlessly the way it was. You did not have to mess with the Java options file. However, Java 10 and 11 and 12, you've got to, you've got to dork with that. So what I did was I, I created a file of, of the, uh, uh, mostly they were garbage collection options that I commented out to make that work. Uh, and then the other thing Cassandra complained about was um, it needed a logs directory. I don't know why they didn't include that in the data stacks uh, community edition, but you just have to create that yourself. Um, so Here's the information. Uh, like I said, this, I'm going to give you my uh, GitHub link in just a second. Um, I have the links here about our database secrets engines. And then if there's, you know, like, for example, there's a database you don't see. Um, Vault is extensible through plugins. So we go through how to build a plugin. And then I also give you our, the repo, since Vault is open source, of where you can pull down the plugins and use those as a model, OK? And, I'm kind of doing this on my own right now with Couchbase. So uh, Katie's been talking to me about doing a talk. So maybe I'll do my talk on Couchbase plugin. So anyway, um, that's an idea. And this is my last slide. Um, this is, I took everything from this talk and put it in my GitHub repo. So uh, basically just Google GitHub and my name there and it's the top repo. I just put it in there last night. So that is it. Um, that's it for my presentation. And I've got five minutes left for questions.